When we think about battles today, although we know the second part of what I'm going to say, but we, and I'm not sure if people in the past actually understood it in the same way, we tend to ignore the second part of the reasons people go into battle. So right now, for example, there's, there is shadow boxing going on in the Straits of China between the US and China. And our newspapers tell us that this is Chinese aggression. And uh, I'm sure their newspapers tell them the exact opposite. But both newspapers, are, as well as the readership, are fully aware that this is just a proxy war for gaining a, an economic advantage. If China was half the size it is today, two things would not happen. It would not be flexing its muscles in, in the Straits of China. And uh, the U.S. would not be paying much attention to it. But China is now posing a, a, a material threat to the well-being of the United States. Whether the U.S. continues to be the number one superpower in the world in the next 50 to 100 years or not depends greatly on the kind of power China will be wielding in the world, the kind of control it would be having over natural resources, over the uh, areas of travel, the, uh, the, uh, the water, sea, seaways and so on. That is essentially what this is all about. But it's presented in a different guise, so you get the impression that the Chinese have a moral defect. And I'm sure their newspapers present the argument such that the Americans have a moral defect. They war among us. And this is the only reason you have war. So coming to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu we don't obviously we don't have a picture coming from the other side. One, because there are multiple other sides. There's not one other side, there are many other sides. There's the Jewish other side, there's the Muslim other side, then there is the imperial other side. Do you see what I'm saying? From the Muslim standpoint, it is all a war of uh, raising the flag of Islam. And to, to what extent that is true is, is very important. But before we get there, what was the, the, uh, the behavior or the pattern for war, or the rationale for war before Islam? It was really undertaken in order to address moral or ethical issues. They had the same issues that we have with the Straits of Hormuz, uh, the, the Chinese Sea, uh, the Suez Canal. They had the very same issues. The old, in fact, it's it's. I mean, is, are human beings prone to war or are they prone to peace? Are they, how are we wired? This, this is a burning question that would probably not be answered regardless of how much time we spend scanning the books of history. So Arabs engaged in three types of economic activity. The one that is obvious happened in Medina, which was farm. So you had date farming, right? You had animal husbandry. So that's the one kind. But that, that's something, Makkah doesn't didn't have it, still doesn't have it. Taif has it. And Taif is close by, so they can, they can engage in the second part of commerce, of commerce, which is actual trade itself. And the Quran speaks about this trade, and it says, you know, woe unto Quraysh for not paying attention to the good that we've given them in summer and winter and so on. So they used to travel south in the summers and, sorry, in the winters and north in the summers in order to trade. 
But the third form of, of commerce was war. So it was, it was not because you had scores to settle, because your pride was injured, because someone had uh, misappropriated some of your possessions illegally, but primarily because you had to uh, enjoy or acquire an economic advantage. So you understand what, what, what the, the basis of the economy was. Before I move on to the next part, none of you is old enough to remember that some of you might have ancestors that you had conversations with. By the way, if you, had, if you still have some of them and they're 80 and above, uh, you should pay careful attention to what they're saying because they are a, a literally a dying resource. They have tons of information. And this is this is history. It's called oral history, actually. So I know that uh, in the 30s and the 40s, and the 20s and earlier, you couldn't just go to Makkah and Medina just like that. If you had to leave to, from Makkah to go to Medina to visit the the, the, the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would have to arrange a posse for you, a militarized posse. Because if you decide to go, you and your wife and the two kids, your wife would be kidnapped, your kids would be taken away, and you would probably be killed. Quite common. Quite common. So, you know, you, have, you might have your own opinions about the Saudi government, and God bless your souls, they certainly have reasons to have earned your ire. But there are some good things that they have put in place. One, of, one is that they have made passage safe. You can sit in a bus and travel. You can sit in a car and travel. The thought wouldn't even occur to you that I could be attacked. But with the Arab attack pilgrims, for judge, they were actually following the Arab tradition. Remember the tradition I told you about? That this is one form of, of, of commerce. So when they when they attacked you, it was nothing like like gangsters would say, it's not personal. You know, it's purely business. So this is why they did that. This is why they did that. And uh, so, you, so you got that part of it. So one of the most important battles that takes place in Islam is the Battle of Badr. And the Battle of Badr, the third or the second or the third year of Hijri, second year of Hijri. The Battle of Badr takes place. So here's, here's where I want you to pay attention. What is it that prompted battles in Islam? If you listen to some of our great scholars, they talk about that the battle was undertaken primarily to raise the flag of Islam. History and historical evidence doesn't seem to support that. To the extent that there is an economic angle to this, which is quite clear. Which is not to say that, that Tawheed and Alai Karimatullah is not part of it. It's what started it in the first place, and I will explain this to you by way of an example. But it was not pure Alai Karimatullah. So we have one scholar, very prominent scholar, who <coughs> makes the distinction between the wars fought in Afghanistan, for instance, previous wars, or the, the, the battle in, in, in Palestine. He says these are good battles, but they're not the kind of jihad that Islam requires of us. You may have heard this, this, this discussion elsewhere. So that, that gives the impression that all the battles that have taken place and Rasulullah and, and the Sahaba were involved in some 39 to 40 different battles. I've got, gotten the names on there, we'll talk about that. You know, all battles are not the same. There were some battles in which Rasulullah participated in the first one as a Ghazwa. If he did not participate in a, in, in, in a battle, he would not be called Ghazwa and so on. There's a Sariya with, with, which, is, which is simply a raiding party. This, this particular battle of Badr was prompted by a, 
by a, uh, an anticipated Sariya, like a raiding party. What do you mean by raiding party? So you know, the Muslims were, they were not forcibly kicked out, but life became so intolerable for them in Mecca that ultimately they had no option but to leave. Pushed out, so to speak. And so they left. I have to apologize for the smells around here. It's not conducive to the masjid and so on, but that's the piping system in, around here. And so it gets fixed. Tarek, everyone's, I'm sure, trying to look at you. Uh, so they were pushed out. And when they got pushed out, they had to leave everything behind. If you were part of the migration that takes place, that took place in 1943, 44, 45, right? I mean, this is around the 45, 47, 47. And then you know what I'm talking about. There are people who just left everything. And they, some people were equipped, were prepared, and so they were able to take what they had. But some people just had to leave on both sides. Uh, so this is how this happened with Rasulullah and, and, and the companions. So they left Makkah and they pushed off. Those who were strong enough could walk out with their heads held up high. Most of them simply had to kind of slink out at, at, in the dead of night. So the, the, the people of Makkah got word that Abu Sufyan would be coming back from the north, Syria, with a huge caravan. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sent out a sariya, a raiding party, to go and capture that. Now you see the connection. Commerce had, had, had three paths to it. This was one of them. Eventually this became illegal in Islam. But in that first battle was because of that. So Abu Sufyan got wind of this that his caravan is about to be attacked. So instead of taking the short route, he went the long way, along the, 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 the path that took him around Jeddah and then back again. So he got it. But the Meccans by that, by that time had already got wind that this is a battle that's going to, that, that there's uh, this uh, possible attack on our, car on our caravan. And uh, that's when things start getting heated. Who do they, who does Upstart say they are? I mean, they really want to flex their muscle with the Quraysh. Do they do? Do they know who they're dealing with, and so on? The kind of, you know, kind of big talk that people engage in in, in, in their in their fits of frenzy. So they went out for battle, and this is how the Battle of Badr takes place. So the the the, the factors that prompted the Battle of Badr, Badr were purely economic. The battle itself takes place within within a, a milieu that is very Islamic. And the Quran then endorses that. And Rasulullah himself is involved and the numbers are up, you know, are oblong. They took a thousand on this side, 300 on this side, uh, ill-equipped, well-equipped, seasoned, untried. So all of those factors played into this battle becoming more than just an economic battle. So when we, when we start looking at these battles, then we, then we see a, a kind of a, a profile that emerges that is not purely one way, it's Allah Kalimatillah. The reason I'm making this point, uh, and I'm going to repeat it, is you have to decide whether you want to accept the accusation that Islam was spread by the sword or not. What we want to do is have our cake and eat it. If we, if we insist that Islam was not spread by the sword, then we, we can make, make that claim. But we still have to explain the 40 wars in which the companions were involved. How do you explain that? If it was not to just spread Islam. Now those who are talking about the irony of this is, those who argue that this is you know, for the sake of Allah, they're falling into this very trap. You see my point now? 
Because if it is khalis and the wajid, la, then those who tell you, you've been, you your, your religion was spread by the sword are absolutely correct. You, 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 you understand how this works now? But if you look at this as a mixed bag in which elements of just economic well-being as well as regional culture. This is not something that almost everything that Islam is accused of introducing were part of the regional package of Arabia, like multiple wives. Islam did not institute multiple, multiple, polygamy or polygamy. It was part of that, that landscape. Slavery. Islam had the, you know, it, people would, you know, a student of mine called me yesterday and tells me, I'm starting class, how can you help me put together a syllabus? So I was helping the student do that. And uh, at that, the class she's working on is, is reading the media. And it's a very important class. I, every Muslim child should be taught how to read the media. Because if you, if you, if you don't read this thing, you know, it, it would, with great circumspection, you don't, you don't know how to read it. It's one thing to read a newspaper, but if you don't know how to read it, reading the newspaper is not just getting the nouns and the verbs and the adverbs and the pronouns right. You have to know what the subtext is. You have to know who the author is. You have to know what the context of the whole thing is. You have to know, and then within that particular art article, you have to know these, these leaps of faith and these generalities. Sometimes you find a guy makes a generality and you buy into it, you don't realize the entire article, it hinges on that one generality. Like is generally believed, Islam was spread by the sword, and off, off he goes. Then this entire article is, 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 is providing evidence for something that is not generally believed, except by some, some one sector within a particular community. So you, you have to know this, so coming back to so my, my point was, I hope I'm not forgetting the point now, the, the point simply was to point out that uh, you have to be able to, to read the stuff. You have to read it carefully, otherwise you're going to make mistakes. So you cannot simply say Islam was not spread by the sword and then say all battles were for the sake of Allah. Because then you're, you're, you're walking straight into it, right? an argument that you don't want to be involved in. On the other hand, you have to say, well, Islam was not spread by the sword, was it all, all because of commercial reasons? No, it's, it was part of that landscape. And you can explain yourself later. But initially, you have to defer and say, this battle of Bad Badr had two parts to it. There was a commercial part to it, and there was an Islamic religious part to it. You can't take the one and drop the other. You do that to your detriment. You do that to your detriment. Uh, if you take the, if you take the the, the, the uh, animosity of the Jewish community, the, the three major Jewish groups that were in, in, in Medina at the time, there's an element of, of of just pure jealousy, perhaps, but there's also an economic angle to it. There's also a political angle to it. You have to put all three of these in front. And say this is exactly why it happened. The person who is steering the ship is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we're talking about him and his era. He is steering you. So he's, he's not going to simply take the boat and shift it in a different direction immediately. It's a very slow process. A very slow process. So he goes along with this idea that the Battle of Badr is going to take place. But ultimately, when you look at all his battles, you see a pattern that emerges wherein he says, battles are only to be fought in defense of lives. No, this is what he says, not in defense of belief. Which goes entirely against the idea that, was, that battles were fought for the sake of... It, 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 this, is, this is astounding. Rasulullah himself, category, I don't have the hadith in front of me, I can get it for you. It says categorically battles are to be fought in protection of lives, not in defense of belief or in attacking belief. And that you might not have not heard this hadith, but you surely have heard this one that Rasulullah says when you go into battle, 
do not kill the aged, do not kill women, right? What, 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 why? Are they not kafirs? If battle is to be fought against a kafir, it doesn't really matter whether the kafir is male, female, or old or young. It doesn't really matter who that, that agent is. But you have to just know these people are posing a threat to us. Their belief is not posing a threat to us. That's the, that's the challenge you have to, 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 to encounter. How do you understand this thing slightly differently? Their belief is not posing a threat to us. It is they themselves. Their other interests that are posing a threat to us. Coming now to the battle of, 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 uh, of Tabuk, and then from there on, go. Tabuk is very interesting because at that time, I, I'm shifting gears now, Tabuk is where those three who stayed behind, you heard the story about the three who stayed behind? That's one instance where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is like the Sufi Sheikh par excellence. It's a, it's a very unusual incident with these three people. You know, the, the Sufi Sheikhs, apart from all the miracles he makes, you know, which are kind of questionable, I'm not saying he doesn't make it right, obviously I can't, I can't validate it or not, but the Sufi Sheikh is there to, to, uh, to help enrich you and, and cleanse you. Does get. We, we don't see too many examples in the life of Rasulullah where he's engaged in Tazkiyah. You know, pure Tazkiyah. He would tell you, make Salah, make Wudu, the kind of stuff I would be sharing with you in Jamaah and other speakers would. But here's someone who. Well, let me tell you the story quickly for those who haven't heard it. That, that they were preparing for Tabuk and, and uh, Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu was one of them, the other two as well. And uh, so the three of them. But they were not the, three, the only three. All told, there were probably about 80 of them. So here, here's what I want you to pay attention to. So they were they're all getting ready to go. And uh, the 80 decided to, to tarry for whatever reason. You know, my leg is legs sore or something like that. And Kabs, Kabs is the longest story that we, that we read of. He says, you know, truth be told, I've been, I've been pretty involved in the, in the effort. I participate in all the battles. I've done everything as required. In this particular situation, it just so happened that I own a farm and it was time for me to, you know, enjoy the yield of that farm. It was harvest time and I thought I'll just harvest quickly and I'll move on. But the harvest was so great I just couldn't finish it on time and it just delayed, 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 delayed. And then eventually I got word that Rasulullah is coming back. And at that point obviously I realized my goose is cooked. So when Rasulullah comes back, everybody goes to Rasulullah and offers their excuses and he accepts them all this is the point I want you to pay attention he offers accepts everyone's excuse inshallah may Allah make it easy for you with a dua you good to go with a dua you good to go with a dua when God comes and says oh God, so what happened he says I don't have any response he says what kept you So Kaab was not giving an excuse. And the other two also. They were not they were not, not presenting any excuse. In other words, they didn't want to be tipped off. Kaab said, Rasulullah said, in that case, uh, I'm done with you. He didn't say exactly that, but basically he said, you can I'm not talking to you. So for 50 days. The Prophet sallallahu boycotted these three. And all the companions boycotted them. And for the last 10 days, 10 days I think it is, he asked them, asked the men 
to separate themselves from their wives. What you must understand is that this is extremely stressful of these people. 50 days in retrospect is not too long. But if you don't know whether it's going to be 50, 100 or a year, then it's extremely long. It's extremely long. And if the person that you, that you cherish the most wouldn't even do something that he himself considers a wajib, then you are in serious trouble, which is to return your salam. So if someone says salam alaikum, saying salam alaikum is a sunnah, responding is a wajib. You're compelled to do that. Unless, of course, you you know, there are other people around and they can respond and that, that absolves you of your responsibility. And he says, I will go into the masjid and try to get close to Rasulullah, look at his face, try to see if he's looking my way. I will say, Salaamu Alaikum, and I look at his lips to see if you know, is there any, any sign that he's responding to me. And Rasulullah just gave him the proverbial cold shoulder for that entire period. The companions did the same. A total boycott. Total boycott for a long period of time. And then when the last 10 days come, he says, man, if I've been separated from my wife, you know, separation only takes place if somebody if falls outside the pale of Islam. That's the point here. He says, I mean, how, how, how much worse can things get for me? Until eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then absolves them of their sins and they are welcomed back into the community. But that whole incident there is an incident that is connected to war, but it is a moment for tazkiyah, for, for purification. So tazkiyah is a very essential element of Islam, very essential. It is ideally done under supervision. So you have someone who can do it for you, you know, basically a teacher. He gets a fancy name like a sheikh, or if it's Farsi or Urdu, then he becomes peer. Or al the Arabic word would be a Murshid. But basically he's a teacher. Whereas if I was teaching you Arabic now, I would be taking you through the Arabic grammar, syntax, morphology, and all the rest of it. He does the same thing. But because he deals with things that are so, um, they are so primal and so dear to your, to your very being, that you know, your relationship is more than just a, 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 a teacher kind of relationship. Because you, you have to open your heart, ultimately you have to open your heart to that person, tell them, I, you know, I have these problems, I need help in this regard. I'm a thief, I'm an, adult, an adulterer. I'm an alcoholic. What we would call therapy today. What we would call therapy is something that the sheikh would take you through. Uh, today, psychologists do it for you, psychiatrists do that for you. Uh, the role of the, of the sheikh or the murshid has shrunk considerably. <coughs> you will still go to him if you want guidance with regard to leading your salah and all the rest of it. So here you have in the life of Rasulullah himself an instance where in, in battle itself there, there comes that moment when he becomes a, a muzaki. And, and quickly before we move on, the, the interesting thing about this is that generally when you talk about tazkiyah and, and, and Sufis, you don't, you don't combine that with war. Because, you know, if you ask the US, US State Department, they say Sufis are pacifists. So every, all Muslims should become Sufis. And uh, the Rand Corporation actually has, an art, has a very big article on, on that, uh, written about which way Muslims should be headed. So if, if you want any directions from, from, from uh, Uncle Sam as to what constitutes a good Muslim, I would suggest that you read the article because it, it leads you straight down the path of, of Sufism. So Uncle Sam also feels that you need to have a shaykh who's going to take you on the path to Su Sufism. And uh, so you don't, normally don't combine, combine the two. But if you look at the wars of liberation that have taken place in Islam in, the early, in, in modern times, quite a few of them were actually undertaken by Sufis. 
the top, there's a, there's a, a very big alim who was executed, his name was Imam Shami. We should, we should incorporate these people into our curriculum, the, the classes that we teach. Uh, these are really the, the, the people that we should be teaching our kids about. Imam Shami was from Central Asia. Now, he was a Sufi. And then we have, uh, there was a, a movie made about this guy uh, from North Africa, The Lion of the... You want to have a word of it? Omar Mukhtar. Omar Mukhtar. There we go. Anthony Quinn. Remember that one? Also had strong Sufi connections. Osman Dan Fodio. Uh, there's in India, there's uh, Sayyid Ahmad Shaheed. All have deep connections to Sufism. So it's, it's not like Sufis are anti-war, but they just, they're not very prominent in it. So, so here, these are two, two things that we, that we thought we'll talk about. The Islamic objective slowly shifted. And the interesting thing to remember about the Islamic objective as far as the battles were concerned was whilst Muslims were wanting, Rasulullah himself was wanting to push the community in a particular direction, circumstances just made it very easy for him. When they were able to subdue Tabuk, then the, uh, the Byzantine Empire, Christian, Eastern wing of the Christian Empire, they got wind of this new challenge that they would be facing coming from the south, from an otherwise disregarded part of the world, which is Arabia. Nobody ever paid attention to Arabia. And anyone who needed to do something would go right past Arabia. Who's the guy from Macedonia? Alexander, huh? Yeah, no. Yeah, who went from, from Macedonia? Alexander. So he went, he went right past it. He went, he went to Afghanistan, he turned <coughs> south to Pakistan, the prominent. His, his chronicles speak about Lahore and Multan. Then he goes into India and he crosses over into, into Egypt. But not Arabia. And now suddenly you have this danger that the Byzantines are facing. That opened the doors for the, the imperial part of Islam's history. And, and it's not like Muslims when were wanting to engage them in battle. They brought battle came to them. In the same way, when you look at the battles that take place in Islam, uh, there's no battle that takes, there's no battle called Ma'rif of Mecca. There's no battle of Mecca. All the, all the battles are taking place at in Medina. So, you, you see the point that, you know, if, if you want to take the war to someone, you have to go out there and fight the battle with them. But if you take uh, Badr is right there, uh, then uh, <coughs> is, uh, Uhad is smack in the middle of Medina, Khandak is in Medina itself. All of these battles take place within that particular area. So it's very hard to make the argument that, that Rasulullah was taking battle out to people uh, for material reasons or even just to raise the flag of Islam. None of that applies. The battles themselves, they did some things for Muslims. They made it easier for people to accept the supremacy of Islam. That's a different story. They made, they made it easier because you keep clobbering someone, especially the, the big guy in, in, in the hood. You know, people are going to stand up and take notice that, well, who's, who is this person who can defeat the, the Quraysh repeatedly? So, so this is how the, the uh, military prowess and the prestige of the Muslim community grew in Mecca, in Medina, uh, without the Prophet Sallallahu himself making battle a, uh, a, a major issue. Uh, two or three things I have to say before I conclude. When you do the, sometimes when we teach our kids history, and our kids are pretty smart these days. And, you know, if you look in a society where kids are taught to ask questions and to be critical, and sometimes it comes to you and says, but you know, Islam is a religion of peace, but every class in, 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 in Islamic school on the life of the Prophet is moving from one battle to the next. You see the point? Religion of peace, and then you do life in Medina, Makkah, life in Medina, and smack you into one. 
Class number five, you're doing the Battle of Badr. Class number six, you're doing the Battle of Ohad. Then you're doing something else and so on. So, how do you explain that? Well, what, one quick explanation for that is, it's like watching a, a TV serial drama. Right? Maybe that's a good bad analogy. Let me give you something else. It's like watch. It's like uh, reading, uh, 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 reading on the life of the prophet. You quickly run over the times actually, and you don't pay attention to it. So the battle, the difference, the, the time lapse between one battle to the next battle may be a year. It might be two years. It might be five years. But because they come back to back, you think it just happened yesterday and today and the day after. So the, the peace that we talk about is in the, in the gaps, see the point? Between the second year and the third year, there's, there's a hiatus there, and that's the, high, the peace hiatus. And then there's a longer hiatus, and so on. That's number one. Number two is the fact that, and that's one of these unanswered questions, that are human beings kind of wired to be in a state of constant war or in a state of constant peace? Uh, you can't find a moment in human history where war is not uh, the modus of, 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 of that particular time, yet the, the primary objective. At every moment in Muslim, in human history, not, not Muslim history, human history, there's some battle going on. And every country is involved in some battle. Which tells you a great deal about, about the quest for peace, for instance. But it's, the reason I'm bringing it up is simply to point out Islam is no exception to this. You get, you, there are religions that don't have to, that don't have to follow this path. Islam was not that religion. So if you take a religion like, say, Buddhism, for instance, for example, Buddhism is, for the most part, until Buddhism becomes a state religion of places like, like uh, Southeast Asia, Buddhism was, was never involved in any major war. But Islam was in a neighborhood where war was prevalent, and then it grew too quickly and posed a threat to the big, two biggest empires at the time, the Sasanian Empire and the Byzantine Empire, and got sucked into those wars. It defeated those two. And once you defeat, once you capture, you have to do what? After capture comes, hold. You can't just capture, you have to hold. And to hold means to be in a state of war footing permanently. What you would say in, 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 in commercial terms in America is if you have cornered the, the, some market, the tire market or the well, um, panel beating market, you know, you, you go through, what is that thing called? The, uh, there's, there's this little thing we, we put together, the acronyms, uh, threats, and uh, well, we, SWOT the SWOT analysis. The SWOT, if you look at the SWOT analysis, one of them is, you know, Opportunity, the other is threat, right? The last one is threat. Threat is what? That somebody can come into your area and cut your turnover by half. So when you when you capture something, you have to hold it. And that's what forces countries and people to be in a constant state of war. And then finally, just to explain this here, uh, the jihad is a general term. Ghazwa is where Rasulullah participates. Sharia is a... Uh, is a, uh, uh, a kind of an attack. Uh, the point I want to make with the, with the word jihad is, I'm happy that there's another word that, that, that should be there, it's called qital. Qital means actual fighting. And it can apply in all three categories. But it's, for now at least, it seems that uh, the Western media hasn't cottoned on to the idea of qital. As, as being war. So they ha hang on to the word jihad. And jihad can be very easily explained by our traditional text. There's, there is allegedly a hadith where Rasulullah says, you've come back from a minor battle to a major battle. I just want you to, to, to adjust that. Rasulullah didn't say that. There was, there was a, 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 a tabi'i who said that. So it, it was, but it's, it's, it's something that everybody ac accepts. The other thing is Rasulullah said similar things, but not that particular hadith. But I, I want to clarify that because people go away with the, I don't want you to go away with the impression that Rasulullah is the one who made that statement about minor battle and major battle. 
he didn't say that. Uh, but this idea that the, that the uh, one, one of the great proponents of, 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 uh, of this particular idea, the great scholar in Islam is a person called Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya. And Ibn Qayyim says that uh, you have four you have four things that you have battle have to battle against. He says you have to battle to protect your property, you have to battle to protect your, your homeland. Those are external battles. Uh, then you have to battle Shaitan, who is the whisperer, and then you have to battle yourself, the nafs. And he says that is the most difficult battle. Because the the success of all the three other battles are contingent on your success in the first battle. And Kabi and Mari obviously failed that battle. In the, in the, in the, that's what happened to him then. He couldn't get up on time. Not the first day, not the second day, not the third day. Eventually, he just lost that battle and suffered the consequence. Now, every time somebody reads Surah, Surah Tawba, the story's going to come up. I don't know if he's happy about this or not, but it's, it's about him. So the, the idea that jihad is a jihad upon oneself is, is a key element of, 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 of Islamic Tazkiyah as well. You stop here, if you have any questions, you can ask. Yes? It's the more modern war. Uh, modern war. More modern, like more recent one. Uh, That's a good question. I, I, have, I, have, I have something to say about it, but let's hear your question. The Ottoman uh, invasion of Romania, Romania you would call it. Uh, genocide. genocide, yeah. yeah. Okay, two or three things. In Islam, only one person is considered masoom. Only one person. For Sunni Islam, that is. And that is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nobody else is masoom. No one else is masoom. If you can please get that out of your head. So if you hear tomorrow morning on the news that some Muslim killed another guy in, in a bank robbery, uh, don't, please don't say, you know, he was, he was pushed into it, he was prompted, because, because that's, that, that kind of reflects that sentiment of yours, Muslim won't do that. And you and I know Muslim get on, they get up to the worst kind of things out there. It's just our sentiment, and it's a good sentiment, but it's misplaced. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I don't, I'm not too familiar with the, with the history of what happened in, 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 uh, during the, 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 the ending times of the Ottoman Empire, but I think there's enough evidence to show that that the, some of the Ottomans engaged in practices in places like Mardin uh, that caused the loss of tens of thousands. I'll take your question now. Yeah, I mean, hold on, let me finish with him first, okay? Um, that caused a life, the loss of tens of thousands of Armenian lives. That may be the case. The evidence seems to support that. Not justified by Islam. Huh? Not justified by Islam in any way. Well, that's why I gave you the story about the guy with the, the bank robber who happened to be Muslim. Right. You know, this Muslims act, like, they misbehave, you know. So, you, it's, it's hard to, 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 to kind of shed that, that, that sentiment. It's a good sentiment. You have to know how to control it. And you have to know that, no, Muslims like to be a one of the most important teachings in Islam is that Isma, being, being in, in, in fal infallibility, only applies to the Prophet or inerrancy, because fallibility is inerrancy. Inerrancy applies to everyone, including him, but in fal in make, make, sinning, only Rasulullah is absolved from that, and the Anbiya. But anyone else, they can be good or bad. I have a very different idea about war in the modern world. I think it is entirely haram. My, 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 just my humble opinion. I think any kind of war in this modern world is haram. And all based on Islamic text. If I look at Rasulullah and his teachings and everything, uh, how do you engage in war in this modern world and you cannot destroy trees? I know, you know, you have such smart bombs now that the guy was standing on the third floor on the balcony in, uh, in Kabul and they sent a bomb in there that just just cut him up into small pieces and everyone else was still safe and secure. Well, hopefully that is the case. 
but I can't see how we can engage in, in a, 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 an ethical wall and still be compliant with the teachings of Islam that tell you that you should not kill the aged, you, should, you can only target, in other words, the only war you can fight is the good old sword fight. That's the only war you can fight. He said, but then, you know, what, what happens to jihad? He said, well, jihad is restricted. You can engage in jihad. If somebody wants to fight you with a sword, take him on. But otherwise, no. He says, but you suffer the consequences. He says, well, so be it. So be it. But, uh, but the, uh, I, 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 can't, I can't justify cannot justify uh, war as it is conducted in the modern world. It is utterly destructive. Utterly, utterly destructive. Yes, you have a question? What do you mean by violence to Islam? What do I mean by? Violence to Islam. What do you mean by? Battling Shaitan. Battling What's your name? Ibrahim. 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 Oh, I hope you didn't ask. Hope you wouldn't ask me that question. <laughs> On the one hand, Shaitan is a person, right? Another name for Shaitan is Iblis. You got it. Uh, everyone else knows this, it's just for you. They all of them are very smart. <laughs> On the other hand, shaitan is, an, is, a, is, is, is like wind and oxygen. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. So the Prophet ﷺ said that shaitan runs in your body like the flow of dam, like the flow of blood. That's a very scary idea. You know, it flows inside your body like you have the arteries and your veins and so on. Same way you have shaitan running through it. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, every human being is born with his or her own shaitan. See, he's got that quizzical look on his face. He's, oh my God, that's what's bothering me on my whole life. Yes. So the Prophet, the, then the companion says, Ya Rasulullah, you also have a shaitan with you? He said, yes. Only pers two persons who did not have shaitan when they were born is Mary and her son Jesus. Only Isa salam, and Mary were born without what is called masfu shaitan, the, the touch of shaitan. So he says, but he says, Allah has been kind to me, Allah has locked up my shaitan. But I was born with one too. You see the humility of, I mean, on the, on the one hand, he is stating his, what Allah teaches him, but you see the humility of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He's not like that, oh, I'm Nabi, no, Rasulullah is our Nabi. But uh, he's just candid about it, he says, my brother Isa, he is born without shaitan. They got it now? Okay, anyone else? <coughs> when you were talking about the... Battle of Badr. <coughs> so, like, there is one Indian teacher, you know, Islamic uh, practitioner of the war, and there is Yes, yes, good point. So, <laughs> you can well imagine Abu Sufyan when he first undertook that journey, he was, he was quite safe. This is like the, the, kind, the kind of psychological impact you'd have and God protect you from it. Uh, you know, where South Africa, it happens so often that our first, in, first response is to look around. And you walk out of of your, the masjid into a parking lot and somebody mugs you, your sense of innocence is gone. It never comes back. That's it. Every time you leave the masjid, 
every time Abu Sufyan was doing that journey north to south, he would have one eye on, 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 on the east. Are these guys going to attack me or not? So yes, it, 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 it did not destroy the trip, but it made it some, so you, now you need, you need extra security, you have to take scouts with you, you have to just, uh, uh, do reconnaissance, all of those things came into play. So it was a gradual erosion of Horatius' power. And it starts there. It starts there. But also when it comes to the Islamic, you know, battle of the war, even in Badr, I think you mostly uh, mention about the economic. But during the battle itself, it was all... When, during the? During the battle itself, it was all Islamic. Yeah. When Badr was fighting with Badr. That's right. But there's a, there's, a, there's a difference, there's a side to that as well. You don't want to put too much on your shoulders. These, you know there are verses in the Qur'an that speak of وَقَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ And they've become very prominent in modern times. Very prominent. So, uh, what's this uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, the other one that came up recently and all of them. Uh, they have... They've just kind of isolated these verses. And they use this all the time. So if you have to listen to, you know, if you have to go to, let's just say you're sitting as a sparrow or a fly on the wall in Bin Laden's cave, you would be so happy to be there, I can assure you. Because it's all Allah and Rasul, Allah and Rasul the whole time. The entire discourse is about Allah. They're not, nobody's chewing there. These people are psychologically prepped for a for, for war, and and all of their, 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 their inspiration is coming from these texts. So these texts, they, 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 they kind of, they gain a life of their own because of a situation. And once that situation subsides, so, so now we spoke about Al-Qaeda. If you go back in time, if you take somebody like, uh, let me look at some, so one of these Ottoman sultans, who were, some of them were very pious, some of them not. Uh, Yazid, let's take Yazid, I think, he's, he's a soft top, let's accept him. So Yazid was, had to go to battle. What do you think he would stand up and talk about? He would talk about ayah number 22 of Surah Surah Anfal and Hasa. You understand? Because these are the buttons you have to press to inspire Muslims. So if anyone reads that particular battle, you're going to walk away firmly convinced that by Yazid, he warrants a radiallahu anhu after his name. He was a pious man. But he is simply invoking the very terms and verses and ideas that were used in the Battle of Badr as well. I'm not saying the Battle of Badr was done with these false pretenses. But I'm also saying those people who engaged in the battles that came afterwards, they all became part of that same mindset. Which is, which is to, Yazid is probably going into that battle for his own reasons. But the 200,000 who are fighting that battle, they have, their niyyah is not dependent on Yazid's niyyah. When they're told that you're going to be fighting for the sake of Islam, and they die, they die for the sake of Islam. It's not too different from here. You, 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 people who go to the army here, they're fighting for a good cause. They don't know what the real cause is. Which is why the first thing they have to do is abandon whys and wherefores. They just go into the battle. So this is a very tricky psychological situation you find yourself in. Very tricky. You cannot go with, with an ambivalent attitude in battle. Ah, I don't know, man. I didn't do anything to me, you know. Come on, let's have tea together. He's supposed to kill him, cut his head off, shoot him. You have to shoot him. You can't do that playing buddy buddy. So those who are engaged in the battle, and those who actually, you know, instigate the battle, might not have the same intent. They might not have the same media. They might not have the same objective. But the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are based on the niyyah of everyone who participated. That particular person participated in a battle that was misplaced. 
but his knee was not misplaced. Hard to, hard to accept, but that's true. It's very, it's, it's, I mean, it's, thank God we, can, we, we have examples outside Islam where you, it's very difficult to coincide, to, to, to get, get the two to coincide. The, 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 the reason that the government has asked you to go to battle and the reason you're participating. Marzid, uh, or the, 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 uh, the situation with the Armenians might be one of those cases. But it was, I'll come back to that. It was not as, 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 as heartless and, and as uh, cold as, as the, uh, the Jewish experience. Uh, there, were, there were casualties on both sides. I'm not, I'm try, not trying to, to, to provide any excuses for what Muslims engaged in, uh, but uh, the Armenians were, ultimately the Ottoman Empire was collapsing. And the Armenians were Christians who lived for centuries under Ottoman rule. And they now had an opportunity to side with the Russians or to side with, 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 with the Europeans. And they actually married Arme Armenians as, as Ottoman citizens. So you, you, you understand that it's a difficult situation to find yourself in. The Armenian can respond and say, I was a certain, but I was a citizen of the Ottoman Empire, but I was a second class citizen. I was not accorded the same privileges and rights that are accorded to anyone, to all the Muslims. So you, you see how complicated this thing gets. So the Ottoman Empire is not going to be happy with the with the Armenians because of the of the of the hypocrisy. And the um, Armenians say we don't have any choice. If we want to live a better life, then we would hope that the Ottoman Empire collapses. So that's where the Armenian Ottoman conflict. Uh, should be understood in, in that time. About if we talk in the and you know perspective, let's say Balkan or Al Qaeda, different like the Nia of India is different than the Nia with fighting. But right now these are not government, these are not setting Islam. So how like both people can be judged like Like who? I mean like Taliban leaders are asking people you're saying he's not, he's not government. Instigating his people right to fight who, against whoever. So you are saying a person who is fighting for the leader may be forgiven because of his media, he's fighting for Islam, but the leader is instigating for his own end. But at the end, they are not both fighting for the good cause. Both of them. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, I, that's where I disagree. I think the guy who's the foot soldier, he's fighting for that. If you Nia is right. For example, the Taliban, is, is it a legitimate government or not? You, you seem to be inclined to the view that it's not. No, Let's just assume. I'm just saying an example. Okay. Uh, and, and, and the person who's fighting in the army would say, I think it's legitimate. So it's, uh, it's, you have to make that distinction between the niya of the individual who's fighting in a war and the government and its reason for instigating the war, uh, and whether it is an Islamic government or a non-Islamic government. And right now it's not a big problem for us, for us, but I think in the next 10, 15, 20 years time, you know, there was this Muslim guy who was killed in, in Iraq, uh, of Pakistani origin, what is his name? And, uh, no, no, he was part of the US Army. He was killed in Iraq, and uh, his father spoke out. Gold, gold star man? Huh? Oh, uh, gold star man. Khizr, Khizr, there we go, Khizr. Khizr Khan's uh, son, that's right. Tough situation to find yourself in. Very tough. Islamically, as an American citizen, you have an obligation to, to, to take up arms to defend this country. You have an obligation. If you're living in this country, you have, you have an obligation. Uh, does that obligation extend to you taking up arms and flying off, off to Iraq and fighting a war there? Then everything becomes murky. Because the argument there is, if you don't take the war to them, they will bring the war to you. That, that's the logic. Uh, but it's, uh, we're not there. Well, hopefully we'll be gone by now. Some, some other chef or the professor can answer that question. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. Uh, 
know that the, the reference you made about the Palestine school deal was for the Jewish experience? The second question is for the Battle of Badr, but Muslims destroyed in blood that were in the area, right? So how is that different? The water one. <coughs> how did, good question, second one, uncomfortable question. So this is the first one first. The first one was that to do with the Jews, right? What, what was the first question? Just, just, just uh, rephrase it so I can. So I just understand the reference that you made about as 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 the Armenian experience was not as cold as the Jewish experience. I'm talking about uh, Germany. Okay, I see. All right. Uh, as I explained to you, the Armenian experience was was part of that breaking up of the Ottoman Empire, and the Armenians were taking sides. The Jews were not taking any side; they were just living in that that part of the world. It was systematic, it was barbaric, it was unprecedented in human history. An entire group of people could be wiped off the face of the earth simply because of who they are. Uh, your second question again? The battle of Badr, the destruction of the water wall. Under normal circumstances, obviously it's haram. Number one. Number two, under those circumstances, I'm not sure if they were permanently, they were destroyed or they were simply rendered inoperable temporarily. In other words, you can, you can go in there and take out the, 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 the I, think that, I think that's basically what happened. They just took uh, pieces of, of uh, bricks and things like that or they took sand and they stuffed it in there so they could uh, um, deny the Arabs of Makkah uh, the opportunity to quench their thirst. I don't think it was permanent, but your question is, is actually it, 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 it uh, syncs with my own concerns about modern warfare and what impact it has on the environment and things like that. Does the question of the Jewish experience have anything to do with Absolutely, absolutely. And, and in modern warfare, uh, you cannot avoid it. Maybe, maybe modern technology can get to the point where you can avoid it, but right now, you cannot engage in any kind of battle without causing uh, irreparable damage to the environment and to, to innocent human beings. Uh,